freedom is is very precious a prisoner is supposed to be in the custody of the court so i think the court has to take its custody far more seriously who uh, are being labeled you know terrorists or something you know they <laughs> don't have anything to protect them I extend a very warm welcome to Sudha Bharadwaj. She's out of the prison. My first question is going to be what does it feel like after spending 3 harrowing years in there? What does it feel like? Yes, of course, uh you are walking outside and there aren't policemen on both sides of you you know you do you're, you're not told when to get up and when to stand in the line and when to have breakfast and <laughs> and so on and so forth so uh, yes uh, freedom is is very precious of course uh, the freedom is also very partial because uh, my bail conditions uh, insist that i have to remain in mumbai whereas actually uh, most of the work of my life has been in chatisgarh i can't go to chatisgarh at the moment it's a bit like being in exile in your own country <laughs> yes as a lawyer has it dented your belief in the judicial processes the ju- judicial systems in this country i've been uh, a lawyer for people for now uh, 20 years but even before that i was an activist for the people and even then one has to believe because after all you are going to systems uh, to get relief you need to ha- believe that a system is going to give you justice and uh, of course one has to continue to believe that the kind of cases that you have been dealing with all your life as a lawyer were not easy cases they were difficult and also um i have uh, read uh, uh, you know your iterations on how the legal aid system is quite broken in this country people do not really get the vulnerable the marginalized and uh, those with no access actually yes. have no access to anything yes. you know access yes. is a, is a very uh, privileged concept correct, correct. so you if you right. have if you have no access in one context you have no access anywhere particularly to the system of justice in this country what do you have to say about that no i i i completely agree with you i completely agree with you and uh, when i went to jail uh, particularly during the covid years i mean um, uh, in baikala jail um, uh, i mean almost for 2 years nobody went to court now if you do not have uh, family outside if you're depending on a legal aid lawyer uh, that was a time when even the lawyers could not come to the courts because uh, they uh, you know uh, they were not even permitted in trains and they have they would have to you know take uh, cabs costing them you know maybe 1000 rupees each way to, to you know just come and take mulakat so they were basically not meeting their clients at all the legal aid system is such that the remuneration is very very poor for legal aid lawyers so actually they don't have a budget to come and take a mulakat to uh, get out papers to get out you know the 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 evidence or the uh, uh certified copies of documents which they need uh, so they basically sort of uh, just do jisko kehte hain kaam chalao you know kaam chalao kind of job of the case but that can mean uh, it can mean imprisonment it can mean sentencing it can mean uh, you know i have even in jail tried to repeatedly whether through a letter or through a discussion with the district legal aid people tried to say that you know you must make it mandatory when when people take when a legal aid lawyer takes a vakalatnama he must must take a mulakat and find out the story of the of of the under trial themselves and when you get the charge sheet you must explain the charge sheet i mean uh, so many of those women are simply illiterate and even if they are literate they might not necessarily know marathi and marathi was not even my language so i had to struggle to read my enormous chart sheet here the communication is one way it's only when the lawyer wants to contact you that they can contact you you cannot contact the lawyer you know so uh, 
uh, legal aid lawyers have to understand this and be far more responsible to their clients. You know, otherwise, seriously, there can be a miscarriage of justice. Your time in jail, has it uh, had an impact on you as a lawyer? One thing that uh, I have understood that the, you know, lawyers have a tendency to feel that, uh, you know, they are sort of, uh, because they know the law and they have, a, they have a great tendency to rely on papers. But so often I have found that the story which the, the prisoner tells is so, so very different from the story that is written in the charge sheet. Uh, whether it is because uh, the facts uh, are, you know, have been uh, distorted or suppressed or, you know, selectively uh, recorded or, uh, you know, something like that, that uh, uh, how, you know, sort of uh, maybe a crime can be created out of a non-crime and vice versa. So, um, uh, you know, it is... It is something that which I knew when I was working with workers and so on, that one has to listen very carefully to one's clients. But uh, I'm even more convinced that really we, as lawyers, should really um, listen very carefully to our clients. They, nobody knows the facts better than they. Would you say uh, that you are a true nationalist, you are a true patriot? Yes. I mean, loving a country is not loving the territory of a country. It is not loving the money of a country. It is not loving, you know, it, it is loving the people of a country. And uh, all my life I have been working for uh, people who have been uh, deprived, who have uh, faced you know, injustice, and uh, for the poorest of the poor. And uh, in, my, in my opinion, uh, that you know that is love for your country what else does love for your country mean what are your plans you seem convinced that you would be acquitted do you have a, a plan in place that once you know all this is over this is what i'm gonna do well i can't say when it will be over it's difficult to say when the trials will start for the time being i have to live in bombay the, the bail conditions say i have to live in bombay so i i uh, you know in the foreseeable future, I'm in Bombay, uh, in Mumbai. Well, it's a it's it's an alien city for me, an expensive city to find out where to live and how to support yourself. I've got a daughter to support, um, and uh, yes, so. But I do want to, uh, as soon as I am able to somewhat settle down, to uh, put on my black coat again and. Uh, yeah, uh, to at least help some of the prisoners whom I met in the jail. I would also like to work with trade unions if it's possible and uh, maybe represent some labor cases. Uh, in, in the whole of my life, I have not really done law for earning much, so I don't expect to earn very much from it. I have to search for some source of earning also. But let's see. It's a difficult time ahead. Three suggestions that uh, you would want to put on the table for improving uh, the justice system. And I have been thinking about this very closely. And I think the first and foremost thing is that the legal aid system uh, has to focus on actually giving legal aid, not, you know, holding wonderful, you know, sort of se seminars and webinars and giving bouquets and, you know, garlanding X and garlanding Y. Prisoners are, are aware. They know that they, they should have a lawyer. They know that their charge sheet should come within 90 days. They know that if the charge sheet doesn't come within 90 days, they should get bail. They mostly know all these things. Problem is that there's nobody out there to argue for them. You are going to give a legal aid lawyer 3,000 rupees or 5,000 rupees for doing an entire trial, which may take years and years and years. How is that legal aid lawyer even going to afford, you know, getting out documents? People in the legal aid, you must pay them well, as well. I mean, you must say that defending the state is very important, no doubt. But defending the citizen, and often it is the citizen versus the state. Defending the citizen equally is very important too. Marvinous national law universities are producing people for corporate firms uh, because it's difficult to make a living as a lawyer. Uh, and particularly as a lawyer working for those people who can't afford to pay you fees. 
and those are the people who need you the most so uh, entire overhaul of the legal aid system is necessary if somebody is a prisoner is facing a personal problem like hospitalization like illness like uh, uh, like a death in the family like you know a pregnancy like a miscarriage like whatever this has to be communicated to the judge and the uh, to the court and to the legal aid lawyer immediately so that some steps can be taken about it there should not be this gap so that you know a person is actually suffering in jail and the court doesn't even know after all a prisoner is supposed to be in the custody of the court so i think the court has to take its custody far more seriously and and the third thing the third suggestion which i have is okay you it's a covid time you don't want to expose the prisoners you don't want to bring them to court then for god's sake improve your video conferencing system why did you uh, decline uh, the offer of uh, becoming a high court judge <laughs> well uh, it was a very kind offer on the part of the uh, then chief justice i think um, i i don't know whether it would have really gone through because he also said well my brother judges have some uh, reservations but i think so so i don't know i mean it was just a possibility uh but uh i very respectfully i i was very thankful that and very honored that he thought me capable of being so uh, and i told him that you know i thanked him that he thought so but i said well sir good people are required on every side good people are required on the bench good people are required in the bar and when they're good people on both sides then only we can give justice uh many people uh, you know uh, think that i could have done more justice on the other side i very seriously doubt it <laughs> who do you think is the most discriminated against uh, group when it comes to judicial uh, processes oh dear that's a very difficult yes i know because you have uh, have an entire buffet to select from as far as the judiciary is concerned there's some discrimination it recognizes it recognizes gender discrimination the dalits continue to be discriminated against but again in the constitution there is you know uh, there there it, it recognizes that discrimination uh adivasis workers all all of them all of them are deeply discriminated against uh however they have remedy the problem is now coming to those who uh are being labeled you know uh you know terrorists or something you know they <laughs> don't have anything to protect them so you know when the day you start thinking uh, of you know every adivasi in a naxal area as a terrorist or every kashmiri as a terrorist or every muslim as a young muslim youth as a terrorist then what do you do because these are discriminations which are not spoken about in the constitution because the constitution never imagined the situation where would we would do something like that no thank you so much for this fantastic conversation thank you nishta thank you